Welcome to the Swim Swim Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining me today, I've got a very special guest. He is an award-winning journalist. He's covered 16 Olympics and Paralympics for the BBC. Uh, He's a swimmer himself. We're going to hear all about his own personal swim journey today, and he's giving us his insight on the ISL, on the BBC coverage of the upcoming 2021 Olympic Games. We have Nick Hope. Nick, how's it going, man? It's going great. Thanks so much for having me and for that uh, build up. Yeah, absolutely. We, we try to do. <laughs> we try to do a good job at introing our guests. Um, so let's let's start with a little bit about you. Tell me about your swimming background. You said you started swimming at a young age. Um, tell me about your roots in the water. I guess like a lot of people here in the UK and around the world, you know, I uh, had asthma as a kid, and doctors recommended to my parents that the best thing to do to kind of not necessarily cure it, but work with that was to try out swimming, build up that lung capacity. So I was in the water from maybe four or five years old. Wasn't that good for quite a while. I was a bit of a slow developer. Um, I think, you know, we have something called um, like personal survival tests that you do in the UK. And they're not supposed to be that difficult, but it took me longer than pretty much my entire class to pass these. I mean, I was... Most people pass them when they're sort of 10. I was going towards like 11, 11 and a half before I got through them. And then all of a sudden kind of joined a a club, started enjoying it even more and kind of got into the racing scene and then kind of followed it through from there at sort of uh, junior competitions in my local area in Greater Manchester. And I had a bit of a kind of decision when I was a kid, whether I was going to take on swimming or I was going to do sailing, which I was also doing at kind of junior national age group level. Um, but I kind of decided that I loved being in the water more than out. And for sailing, that's pretty much a devastating move. So it had to be, you know, the swimming that I followed through. Yeah. And, uh, obviously it took on and, and you did become, you know, you, you took your swimming career to, to pretty significant heights. You were a captain of the Lancaster university swim team. Um, what, what was that experience like for you, you know, leading your university team? I mean, I'd always loved competing um, and kind of found that, although I always trained really hard, I think getting that kind of captaincy position really sort of focused me because you know that other people are looking at you. And although, you know, generally, if you talk about Lancaster University and the swimming team, we're probably better known for, you know, success at drinking than we probably are in the pool. Uh, But we really (laughs) did do our best. You know, we have annual competitions against uh, York University. It's called the Battle of the Roses. For us, that's almost bigger than nationals because it's a huge kind of local regional uh, rivalry. We went three years undefeated whilst I was the captain. So, you know, that is one of my (laughs) proudest moments in the pool, I think, undefeated in the 50 metre backstroke. So, uh, you know, yeah, as I said, proud moment for me um but I mean that was you know having that university sort of career there was was a great bonus for me because maybe three four years before that when I'd done the junior national uh, age reach camps um I was on holiday the weekend afterwards uh, in Puerto Ventura with my parents and I guess like most lads at that age you want to sort of show off in front of any girls that are around the pool um, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to really show off and show what I can do in butterfly. And at that age, in, in a hot climate, you shouldn't really need to be able to do a warm up. You shouldn't, shouldn't need to. Um, <laughs> but I dove in, was really giving it some on the fly, and my shoulder just went ping. I basically uh, tore my pectoralis major in my left shoulder. So obviously, most of your listeners will know that that's a, a pretty big injury in, in swimming terms. You know, from a football or soccer perspective, it's like doing your, your cruciate knee ligaments. For those that don't know. And it wasn't diagnosed straight away and it broke down a lot in training because we didn't quite know what the problem was. So when I was kind of on that upward trajectory, 14, 15, and sort of starting to to move up the rankings a little bit, um, it was kind of all halted all of a sudden. And then having that university sort of career gave me an opportunity to, to enjoy the sport again for another three years. Nice. 
uh, I mean, having, having an injury like that can always be such a setback. And so it's, it's cool to, to hear that you did eventually get to continue your career after that. And, uh, you know, be a captain undefeated 50 backstroke. <laughs> what an accomplishment. God, that's, that's so cool. Um, so I, I, I want to pivot topics. Um, sure. so to the here and now, uh, we've got ISL right on the horizon. Um, the first competition starts in just a day or two. Um, mm-hmm. BBC just got the rights to, uh, to cover this ISL season, which I'm really guessing you're in there the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> just slid in there. Um, tell me, tell me about your thoughts. What are you excited for? What are you expecting, um, with this obviously very different looking season two of ISL? I mean, after seeing how big season one was, I know the, the, the ambition was to be even bolder for season two, but I think we've just got to put everything in perspective with what's happened in the world this year. It is amazing, and we're so fortunate as swim fans and broadcasters to have the sport back and to have all of the world's, or the majority of the world's best athletes all in one place. I mean, you know, just going back a few months ago, you wouldn't have really thought anything like this would have been possible you know you're going to you know most of these people haven't competed since february march maybe even earlier in in some cases and with so many unknowns about the olympics still we think obviously it will take place next summer but there's still speculation it could be you know postponed again it may not happen so to have something like the isl has given the athletes a focus it's given us something to talk about from an olympic perspective because i think when you start seeing you know the nba you start seeing premier league football you start seeing formula one cricket athletics things like that coming back it gives you this sense that you know there's there's normality the sporting world is is back to what we used to it being but that really isn't the case. You know, this is a real exemption that we've got in Olympic sport to bring swimming back to the front for people to see it. And obviously if it wasn't for the, you know, billionaire owner in the deep pockets, we wouldn't be able to have this. So, you know, it is, I think it really is. It's, it's huge for the sport and with so few other sports taking place at the moment, it's a real chance to kind of take swimming to new audiences, which is what the ISL basically is all about. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I was talking to, uh, to, you know, our, our, our swim swim owners today and they're kind of like, you know, we're, we're holding solid in terms of people visiting our site, people interest in swimming, but in terms of ISL news, it's kind of like, it's kind of flatlined a little because we keep putting out news and everyone's kind of like, yeah, okay, we see it, but when's the swimming going to happen? And so I think we're going to see a real, up to I think everyone's just kind of on the edge of their seat like okay we get it the teams are there everyone's there we want swimming and uh and like you said I think it's going to be a big opportunity for a lot of people to kind of get involved because it's the only show in town um Mm. do you have any any immediate thoughts for this first competition that's coming up in just a couple days I think you know before talking specifics on, on the teams it's just I want people to see that format and why those of us who saw season one were so excited about it and why it's not just another swimming competition. And I don't, that's not wanting to diss world championships, world cups, the Olympics, which are always amazing in their own right, but they've never had the glitz and the glamour around them that Mm -hmm. the international swimming league was, you know, I was just watching kind of a highlights reel from Vegas. I mean, you know, Swimming went to Vegas. You know, went to you Vegas. Know, that that statement in itself shows where you know that the sport is go, is going. And you know, I was getting quite sort of like um, into all the details for much the preview that I was doing for the BBC Sport website about all the rule changes. And then I think the piece that I made was supposed to be maybe 600, 700 words. It ended up it was two thousand. And <laughs> someone in the office was kind of going through it, saying, "Well, you know, maybe you've written a little bit too much on this, a little bit too much." And I was getting really kind of into the details like oh but, but the, the these new rules there's a new um the jackpot times things like that to get really excited about and then he was like yeah but the sport will sell itself you know when when, when people see it and they see what the swimmers are doing they see that the good razzmatazz around the sport you know let, let's put up some videos from what happened last year let's let's not get too bogged down in all the details let's pe- let people enjoy it and i think that's what people are going to see right from from the off because the swimmers as well are desperate to get out there, race one another. I know, and obviously it's not just, it's not about times and setting, you know, personal best and records. It's about getting those wins. And I think that's going to be, you know, really refreshing again for this year. 
I think that's what we saw from last year too, right? It, it, the, it as a whole, it wasn't about any specific one thing. It was just the ISL in general kind of sold itself because it got back to the roots. It got back to just getting your hand on the wall first, but it did it in a way that was glitz and glamour. Like you said, I mean, it was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. And that's what people really remembered. If you went to an ISL match and I know I told all my friends, like, you know, this is unlike any other swim meet you've ever yeah. been to. Um, cause it's just, it's you, you see race after race after race. It's not like an age group meet where there's 10 heats of every event and some of them are really slow. It's like, <laughs> right. It's like every event is the, fa- is, is the best in the world. Uh, and so let's, so I'm really, I am really excited for people just to get to see the ISL. Personally, I want to kind of nerd it up though. There's been so many new rule changes with, with how, how the scoring's done. Uh, do you have a personal favorite or do you do, what do you think is going to be really impactful for the scores this year? Do you know, one of, one of the biggest rule changes that I'm looking forward to is obviously if you win the uh, Methy Relay, you then get to choose the stroke for the skins. I yeah. think that is huge. Even before, you know, all of the, the world leading Aussies pulled out of the series, mm-hmm. um, I think it's even more important now because it can be a real leveler. And I think if you look, you know, if you look at the, the, the rosters, the lineups, you know, across the franchises, to me, energy standard with who they've retained versus who others have lost, you know, they are the outstanding team. But yeah. with something like that, it can really level things out. And as well, let's, let's talk about, you know, the, the points uh, situation with the, the jackpot scores. I mean, that is a, a great concept. How on earth we're going to follow it? I have no <laughs> idea because you're going to have things fight because of how quickly these races go. Yeah, information is going to be fired out constantly. I'm glad I'm not commentating on it live. I'm going to be honest <laughs> because that is going to be a real challenge for the broadcasters who are on it on the day. Um, I'm kind of uh, stepping back and, and then reporting on it sort of mm-hmm. as it happens a few minutes later. So I've got a very easy job. Um, but I just think, yeah, there are so many innovations there that are, that are going to be exciting. Yourself? It, yeah. So I, personally, I'm excited for the 100 I am. <laughs> Of course, yes, that's, that, that's like such such a great event to watch like a live happen mm. but yeah i think the medley relay into like what i into you get to choose the skins it's not just 50 free now it's there can be any stroke of skins um i think that will add a real element of depth to it and you know ag- again <clears throat> I think last year we saw some teams kind of trying to even out their relays to just go for those max points in the relay. But with the 400 medley relay now, I'm guessing you'll see just teams bolster their A relay as much as possible so that they can get that skins choice. Um, It'll, yeah. I mean, there's going to be so, like you said, there's going to be so much information firing off that I'm, honestly a little nervous <laughs> about people being yeah. able to follow the score yeah. but hopefully um like we said earlier it, it you know what it will end up being is just is for the most part racing and yeah. lots of racing and i think that's that's what sports fans need right now is just action yeah my one thing i hope that they're not too strict with the time limits in some of the events because obviously you know this year you can lose a point individually you can lose two points in a relay if you don't come within it within a certain uh point of the winner or the um it's actually it's it's a set point isn't it for the events beforehand um given that there's a lot of swimmers who've been drafted in who wouldn't have been there if you know the the aussies had been uh, in the team i don't want that to be a point where it's demoralizing for some of the swimmers do you know i mean the last thing you want is someone kind of showing up so keep up absolutely Yeah. And also, I mean, these are, these are the best swimmers in the world. I don't think it's necessarily going to be a problem, but you know, it's like they, some of these people, like we said, haven't raced in seven months. And so it's going to be interesting to, especially these first few meets as people kind of shake off the cobwebs, get back into racing shape. You know, I'm sure we're going to see some races that there's a wide gap between first and eighth. Um, And so, yeah, hopefully points wise that doesn't go against them too much especially because you know it's been such an extenuating circumstance um 
during this COVID pandemic. Yeah, so certainly. Um, so do you, you know, you mentioned energy standard, uh, do you, but do you have specific swimmers you're really excited to see back in action after these this seven month hiatus, especially considering we were supposed to have an Olympic games this summer and we're robbed of that. Uh, yeah, I mean, we'll start, you know, because of the international names as well in that energy standard setup. I mean, I've, I've been over there to Antalya and Turkey where they're based. I know it's a, it's, it's technically it's a, it's a Paris franchise this time around, but the training base is still there in Turkey. I'm still working that one out, but um, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's, you know, there's some fantastic talent in that squad obviously led by uh, James Gibson the head coach former uh, world champions uh, swimmer who uh, previously you know guided some of the Great Britain's um, best sprinters and, and prior to that Flora Manadou who he's now working with again you know to see him back in action with another year of training because obviously he had all that time out at, um, of the pool and out of training you know we, we thought he might have retired for a while and then he's back and looked fantastic last season but with more with another 12 months under his, his belt and I think, you know, in Turkey, they've been able to train for a good part of a period where maybe other parts of the world, you know, have been, been in lockdown. So he didn't think he's going to be a fantastic one to watch. Obviously, the skins and throwing in different strokes. I mean, he's, he's got he's pretty good at backstroke as well. You know, he's sure throwing a fly. But um, obviously, if the breaststroke starts getting thrown in there, then we're talking about, you know, our man Adam Peaty having a, a chance again. Although, you know, short course isn't his favourite. But he, I think he's growing on him. Um, he's definitely more of the, the long course swimmer with, you know, the Olympic titles, the multiple world records that he has. Um, yeah, but obviously, you know, desperate to see him and see what he can produce. Obviously, he's become a father uh, for the first time, you know, in the, in the last month. So he's had to contend with, you know, the the, the nappy changes, the, the sleepless nights, the even earlier mornings, perhaps. So, uh, yeah, he's, um, you, you know, his, his son was born just a month ago. So, uh He's uh, now having six weeks away, so a, bit, a little bit tough for him, and uh, obviously in that isolation bubble. But yeah, in, in terms of you know other people that, that we're looking at, you know, Ch Ch Chad Leclo, it's always fantastic to watch in, in energy stands as well. And who can forget a certain Caleb Dressel? <laughs> I mean, he's yeah. just taken the world by storm, hasn't he? The last uh, three years or so, um, another guy who has spent a bit of time out with in the uh, the USA before the last World Championships last year one of given everything he is capable of um just one of the most humble guys you know yeah with, a, with a, his, his pet chicken and his, uh, his in his back garden and uh, keeping everything very kind of humble and very real um yeah a good guy and one, and one you want to see do well as well absolutely i i love the narrative of caleb versus florent because you look at them physically and it really you know, it really is a David and Goliath type of situation when you're looking at them because Caleb is, is a big dude. He's muscular, he's tall, but Florent is just a giant. And uh, to see them battle it out, uh, especially in the freestyle skins, is just super fun. Um, and to, to kind of see their different race strategies going into that is always cool. As you mentioned, Chad Leclo can do anything short course, and uh, he's such a talented underwater swimmer that it's so fun to see him race. Um, I'm excited to see kind of the veterans, you know, Lily King went undefeated last year um, yeah. in breaststroke. Obviously, Sarah Showstrom uh, was, was, was an MVP, at, you know, skins master. And then, uh, you know, obviously Katinka. the loss. Yeah. Katinka, God, Katinka is going to be great. And home pool. I mean, you know, Team that's, Lion that's struggled thing. at times a little bit uh, last year, but um, you know, with the, with that, a little bit of home advantage there, and you know, some some good set of signings as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they could be contenders definitely for the uh, for the the knockout, the the semi finals final. I think this time around, and uh, you know, on the, on the female front, I think from, from a British perspective as well, we're kind of looking at because we've not for many years the women's side was our stronger and the guys weren't quite at that level. Um, you had your, you know, your, your Becky Adlington's, your uh, Gemma Spoffers, your Fran Halsalls. Um, and then it's been the guys who've really come on in your Duncan Scott's, Adam Peaty's, uh, James Guy's, um, Luke uh, Greenbank at the last World Championships. Um, but there's a couple of women who are coming on the front now. Obviously, we've yeah. had Siobhan Marie O'Connor, um, yeah. uh, Anna Hopkins, who's been training out in the USA, now back in uh, Loughborough training with Adam Peaty, for, uh, freestyle um, specialist, though. But 
Mel Marshall, the head coach there, and of, of London Royal, certainly knows what she's doing with sprinters. So it'll be interesting to see how she develops. And then we've had um, you know, Freya, Freya Anderson, who mm. has been someone we've been talking about for the last three years, came on as a, as a real, real youngster at a field, first world championships in um, Budapest. Uh, really strong in the relays, uh, finishing those off, particularly the, the medley relays, but individually now, really, she's one of those who will really benefit from the Olympics being delayed by 12 months. Uh, and, you know, she's a European short course champion as well. So she will, she will do well, I think, in this series, the ISL as well. And that's what I, the, the last thing I was thinking was, was for those youngsters to see who really is going to benefit from these seven months, you know, of quarantine, whether you were out of the water, in the water, um, you know, what, what, what's the phrase? It's what you do in the dark that, that really shows when you're shining in the light. It's something like that, but, you know, we're going to see, <laughs> we're, we're going to see who put in the work and uh, who, who has let themselves develop even further in the next seven months. I talked to Matt Grievers, American backstroker, mm-hmm. Olympic champion, and, um, you know, he had said he thought quarantine was going to benefit the old guys and, and the older, the veteran swimmers more. And uh, obviously, you know, I, I think you kind of opt to, oh, well, this would benefit the younger swimmers because they'll get more development. So it, it'll be and it'll be an interesting game to see who gets that benefit in the end. Um, and certainly when we get to see back to back to back racing, um, we'll get to kind of track that development pretty closely, which is which is a lot of fun. Um, so, uh, last, last ISL question, and then we can delve into other topics, but so I was at, I was at the Budapest ISL meet last year. Um, and you know, European fans are second to none, I think, especially in swimming. They're very passionate, especially in that ring when you have Katinka racing in her home pool. I mean, it was nuts. And then, uh, I'm curious, were you at the European Derby last year? Yeah, I did the uh, the London London uh, leg. Okay, and so uh, I yeah, and from what I heard, that meet was was equally as crazy. And so, just obviously, there won't be fans at dur- during this. But yeah. um, given given the European swimming culture, what do you kind of foresee um, as just an environment for these uh, next you know what is it, six to eight weeks of racing? Yeah. Look, I think it's going to be difficult for the athletes who are used to for big events having that crowd behind them. I was talking to Adam Peaty yesterday for our, for our preview coverage of the ISL, and he was saying, well, you know, he's almost going to have to draw on what it was like when he was a youngster competing at events where you, there is no crowd. You've just got to motivate yourself. He was saying, you know, when he is going for a record now, because he's pushed himself so far in the sport, you, the only place you can almost go sometimes for that extra boost is the crowd and sort of to feed off that and they're not going to have that in the ISL they're going to have though the you know the pumping music they're going to know the crowd is there and I think in many ways because they haven't raced for so long it might make up for that a little bit I don't know I mean they've not told us this if they're going to pump in artificial sounds in terms of crowds you know we've had it in uh, football soccer matches here in the UK you can have lots <laughs> yeah. press the red button you can listen to it with fake sound or we can have it without I quite like the fake sound, I'm going to be honest, even though I know it's not real. And there's somebody yeah. who's kind of like controlling the buttons when there's a missed chance. It's quite a, quite an art. Um, but yeah, I think it, it will be difficult and new for the athletes, but I don't think it's something that's that's going to phase them. And I hope it just gets people more excited for when, you know, normality does return. And hopefully, you know, there are these events all around Europe, the USA, and the rest of the world, to be honest, come 2021 or 2022 after the Olympics you know, that more people are going to pack into these venues. Uh, so that's a, that's a beautiful segue into uh, what might be to come in, the, in 2021. Um, so we, you know, we've been told behind the scenes, 2021 Tokyo Olympics, 99% sure it's going to happen. Um, you know, we've, we've been told that it's, it will be, uh, just Japanese fans. And again, this is, this is all unofficial. Um, this is just the rumblings we've heard, um, you know, as a, as a BBC journalist, uh, broadcaster right now, what can you tell us about what, what you've heard or, or what you think, um, those 2021 Olympics are going to look like. And certainly as someone who has been 
to so many Olympic games, how that might differ from past games. Yeah, I mean, there, there will, there has never been, or there will never be an Olympics quite like what we're going to see in Tokyo. Um, I think in, in in years to come, or, or you know, going back decades, because you know this was and has been dubbed since pretty much they won the bid to host the games um, as being probably something bigger than London 2012. You know, perhaps something that could rival Sydney 2000 as being you know the greatest ever Olympics. Um, and it is obviously such. It's so sad that the people of Japan and the Tokyo aren't going to get to see and put on the event that they'd hoped. Um, as you say, you know, every, everything that we're hearing at the moment is of a very scaled back Olympics. So you're not going to have, you know, the well, the fans, the fanfare that you usually do with all the, the not an ISL type of razzmatazz, but there is certainly a special excitement of bringing all those different sports together and having fans that may not like wrestling weightlifting archery on a day-to-day basis but all of a sudden they get excited by it um you know because supporting someone from a from a random nation because they like their name or their outfit or something you know it brings in people from so many different areas um people are now going to be watching it pretty much exclusively on the tv rather than getting the chance to to attend it but which which is so sad as i say but as far as we know and as, as you've said it, it will take place in in some form and i think probably the way the ISL is being held with, you know, the, the uh, athletes forming bubbles going out many, you know, at least a week, probably several come the Olympics um, before the competition going through numerous tests uh, is something that we're going to see and obviously needs to happen if you're going to have anything that is, it is safe for the athletes. You know, I'd, I'd love to be able to see fans from around the world, uh, you know, having been, a, um, you know, as, as many Olympics, as, as you said, you know, those crowds, Obviously, the, the most recent summer games in in Rio um, at times were really incredible. Olympics and, and Paralympics, um, particularly obviously in the aquatic centre, the, the Paralympic Games and uh, Daniel Diaz won, you know, his first gold medal there. Um, that noise was incredible. Um, London 2012, when uh, you know there was uh, just just so much success. You know, I mean, that is when you're thinking back. You know, I'm getting uh, the 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 hairs on my arm as a singer, uh, standing up right now, just thinking back to it. Um, I hope that the Tokyo 2021 will still be an incredibly special event and it is still going to be whoever wins there, whoever gets a medal, they are still an Olympic medalist. That is still something they're going to remember for the rest of their lives. It is still a huge achievement. And I'm sure there are so many things that the broadcasters can, can do to make it special. It's just obviously going to be really difficult for those athletes who go there and there might not be that many people uh, in the venues. But let's not forget there is still, you know, nine months to go before the games things could change you know things could improve hypothetically but obviously as as we stand at the moment it is going to be a very different game to what we've envisaged yeah so to from your perspective again you've covered 16 olympic paralympic games um you have been there for for the action uh both good good and devastating you know there's there's happy moments there's sad moments at every games um for someone who has never been to an olympic games uh i mean what do you think the most important thing you get from being at an olympics is you know what it's not always just watching that performance it's being around people during that moment and seeing their reaction and sharing it with others that is probably the biggest thing about the olympics the way it brings people together because you don't always have you know if you go to um, a specific world championships in um the sport you follow day to day if you go to world aquatics championships you know that go to the swimming events the majority of people there are going to be swim fans they know what they're seeing at an olympics you get people who aren't necessarily specific fans of that they've entered the ballot they wanted a ticket to watch anything they wanted to be part of that home games yes you have experts there but the vast majority of people in those venues are going as fans of sport of the olympic or the paralympic movement and that is probably the biggest thing you take from it i mean for me um one of my most vivid moments has nothing to do with sport from from all the games that I've, I've, i've covered it was the opening morning of the rio paralympic games where there'd been so much negative coverage in the build-up to it. Everyone was worried 
that basically no one's going to turn up. You know, there's all the, all the talk about no, no, no tickets have been sold. There's been no adverts on TV. All these amazing stadiums, which just seem full for the Olympics, mm-hmm. are going to be completely deserted. And, and how sad is that going to be for the athletes who go out there and compete? And I was there at sort of like um, half seven, eight in the morning uh, at the main gates, anxiously waiting to see what happened. And as I got there, which is about an hour before they opened, you just saw this huge row of people. And then when they opened, people piling in, in their thousands to that Rio um, Paralympic, as it was then, park. And then to just that, you know, from my perspective, a bit of relief. Um, but just to see that uh, sh- sheer excitement at being there, to see all these superstars. And, and for someone like, you know, Brazil, it was a real, um, uh, it could be a real shift, a real, you know, catalyst for change in a country like that, which doesn't have, you know, the best reputation for looking after people who have, uh, disabilities and providing the facilities for them to see Paralympics packed out like that and people genuinely excited about seeing those with disabilities racing competing in all of those different sports that was for me yeah one of the greatest moments yeah I mean so obviously seeing Adam Peaty said his world record was pretty amazing <laughs> don't get me wrong it was incredible top two <laughs> it's a little bit of perspective you know that that as a non-sort of sporting sporting moment was pretty absolutely. special as well. absolutely i mean it's yeah it sounds like community it it, it brings community it, it it creates community in in mm-hmm. places where certainly it's not necessarily there always yeah um, I mean, london was a great example for that if anyone's been to, to london i know a lot of major cities are like that as well you know you get on public transport everyone is head down looking at the phone looking away you don't give direct eye contact to anybody um yeah. london 2012 everyone was talking to one another on public transport which is generally seen as a pretty weird thing to do um mm-hmm. for me as someone from from the northwest where if you get on public transport people do tend to, to to talk to one another it was almost like going home you know london for those two weeks the olympics two weeks the paralympics changed and i think that's it that's what you know the olympics the paralympics say it does brings people together and certain like even as you talk about oh like people are talking on public transit I'm like, like, this is what COVID has done. And now I'm like, no, 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 you cannot do that. You can't talk to people. You can't be on public transit, right? It's, it's, it's grown people apart, you know, it's isolated. Um, And it's out of necessity. And I think it's the right thing to do, obviously, you know, but it's, it's a, it's a sad time because you, you don't feel um, that immediate, that immediate, like, you don't feel safe in connecting with people and bonding with people. And um, so hopefully, you know, th- that Olympic Games, even though, you know, fans will be limited and most people will be watching it in front of a TV or a computer screen, can still have that effect of, of bringing community, of, of making community where there wasn't any before. Yeah. People, yeah, people need things to to bring them together. And, you know, with, with you know, not just... COVID, everything that's happening in the world, politics as well. You know, there are a lot of um, divisive views, agendas, all kinds of things going on at the moment, which is which is which are separating people out. And something like the Olympics doesn't do that, or the Paralympics. You know, that is something that people can can enjoy together, regardless of who wins, loses. You know, it, it is that celebration of sports. And you know, yeah, as you say, it's not going to be a let's. Um, possibly, you know, go around to someone's house or let's watch this on the TV together. It might be a, right, we'll do a Zoom call and chat about it later or it'll be something that gets, you know, someone sending a, a, a WhatsApp or text messages to somebody else, but it but it will get people talking. And that is, you know, so important at a time at the moment where, you know, a lot of places around the world are going into this kind of uh, second wave phase and there's a lot of uncertainty. Yeah. Uh, so so speaking of, of building community, you know, I... I am a firm believer that the swimming community in particular is a very special place. You know, it, it can bring people together in a way that you don't really find too many other places. Um, you know, I know for you personally, <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, I know for you personally, uh, like, you, like we said, you were the captain of your university team and then you stepped away from swimming for a while. And um, eventually you were able to make your way back to the sport. Tell me about, what what you discovered uh, was so important to you about swimming in the swimming community? 
I think when I, when I stopped after uni and obviously, you know, the, the focus was, you know, for me being the best journalist I could be. And I didn't really have time to be going to the pool all the time. And, and when you've been at a certain level, it is it is um, it's difficult to just go to the pool and plod along without a target, um, but also to know that you're not in the shape that you used to be. Um, that, that can be a little bit difficult from a, you know, just a psychological point of view and, and just looking at yourself in the mirror. Um, but there was always kind of something missing, you know, for me, you know, live broadcasting is probably as close as you can get to the adrenaline buzz that you have when you're racing, because, you know, if you mess it up, you look terrible. It is the end of the world. <laughs> now, no, I don't know why, why, why I went to that first, but, but, but the flip side being when you nail it, it feels amazing as it does in, uh, as it does in racing. Um, and for me, kind of like the, the, the moment where I sort of got back in is um, it was, uh, 2014 and uh, I broke up with my then girlfriend. I was feeling quite, um, quite low. You know, I was, I was suffering with uh, depression at the time and I just needed something to, to focus on. Um, and I kind of thought, well, I could get back in the pool again. Um, and it took me a while to kind of accept that's, that's, that's a good thing for me to do because I still have my shoulder problems and I need to, to manage it. But it gave me something else to focus on every day, trying to build it up a little bit more. And then once, you know, I started feeling a little bit more normal again, it's like, well, I need, I need something to push me a little bit harder. And it, it was just so random. I was at a, I was at a house party in London uh, with a friend of a friend. I'd ended up somewhere completely by chance. And there was a guy who had a top, a low low cut top with a with a tattoo and it said it's like team gb and i was sort of chatting to him about it and um he said oh i'm a swimmer i was like well i know i know most of the swimmers i don't i don't know you and he's like oh i'm a, I'm a great britain masters swimmer and i was like what on earth is masters swimming so basically it's swimming for old guys for those that don't know out there you can <laughs> after 25 and they go in um age groups uh, five years all the way up to you know there's, there's people in their 90s and their, their hundreds who are, who are racing um so I looked at that and thought, wow, what a, that's different. Why don't I give that a go? So, yeah, I um, got back in the pool competitively back in 2015. At the beginning of 2015, qualified for the World Masters, raced in Kazan. They were held in Russia after the, the real world championships for the elite guys about two weeks afterwards. And, yeah, from there, I've kind of just carried on, obviously still doing all of my work, and it's something that I do on the side, but it's just – from my perspective, great to be back in the sport. I think even when I was covering swimming for um, the BBC, I found it quite difficult because I sort of, particularly like if there was the 100 metres, the 200 metre backstroke races, I missed being there. Um, and now I don't actually, do you know what I mean? I can see elite swimming for what it is and I love watching it. And I don't feel um the, the jealousy that I used to to be honest because I have my own thing that I do elsewhere and that gives me a little bit more I think perspective on it um but yeah as I said I, I fully recommend uh master swimming for anyone out there unless you're in my age group I'm better than me uh, backstroke <laughs> maybe go elsewhere. but um no it, it really has been a great thing because it's, it's, it just gives you an extra kind of lease of life and I think that even though your career that you're on when and that path that you're on was a, as a kid may not have worked out there are still ways to stay involved in the sport. Yeah. And I, I, especially, I think from an American perspective, you know, it's like, well, if you don't win a gold medal, you're kind of a failure. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know if that's yeah. other countries perspectives, but it's like, you, there, there's so many ways to enjoy something, to enjoy a sport. And I think that's a super healthy way to just, you know, do it because you enjoy it, do it at what level you enjoy it you know and if it becomes too much take a step back um mm -hmm. but yeah that, that seems like a very cool reintroduction to swimming and um obviously now you've had some success you went to the world championships and that is really cool um so so lastly the last topic i want to cover is again from an american perspective you know we have we have rowdy gains as one of our as one of our broadcasters, top swimming broadcasters, mm -hmm. people give him so much crap, uh, because, because of how he broadcasts. And, uh, are you familiar with Rowdy Gaines broadcasting? Yeah. 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 And, uh, and so I don't think they, uh, I don't think a lot of people realize how many hours 
you know, someone like him, someone like yourself is putting into covering a swimming competition like this. He doesn't just waltz in and, mm-hmm. and for two hours during the final sessions go, Oh, this, this is, this guy's doing this thing. This guy's doing this thing. And so, I mean, it's, you know, sometimes it's 12 hour days, sometimes it's 20 hour days. Uh, you know, when, when you're just doing your research, when you're learning all the names, et cetera. So heading into this ISL season, which is, you know, a six week season, there's a lot of racing going on. Um, give me an idea of what your day-to-day schedule is going to look like. Yeah, I mean, it got thrown a little bit by the new schedule coming out today for the ISL. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Because I thought I sort of had it planned. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's going to be watching a lot of it via streams because uh, like most of us can't be out there in Budapest, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But yeah, let, let's take this week, for example, obviously been speaking to several of the British and the international swimmers to mm-hmm. kind of prepare coverage to preview the series. So I work across TV, radio and online for both our domestic outlets and our BBC World um, programs. So it's basically been about trying to find things that work for everybody. So from a domestic point of view, you know, if you can get an Adam Beatty in there, people are gonna kind of hook into that. And then from an international yeah. perspective, can you get hold of Caleb? Can you get hold of Katinka? Or um, we did a piece actually with uh, Alia Atkinson from Jamaica okay. um, yeah. this week as well. So it's been getting, you know, chats with athletes and getting people talking about the series. Once it comes to the actual race day, um, we will be doing kind of social media coverage building up into it and to try and direct people towards our coverage in the UK. Um, we then obviously I'm writing reports and sending updates during the event writing a report afterwards and then being across all the feeds and the reactions and then trying to feed that out to um, not just the, the international and the domestic sort of, um, how would I say, the national broadcaster here in the UK as the BBC, but also our regional teams. So in, in the northwest of England, the southeast, Wales or Scotland, for example. So we're trying to get as much with all of these athletes to push out to people so that it's also personalised. It's not just this international event that's happening you know, somewhere else in the world. It's also relevant to, to people in Wales, to people in, in Shropshire, Manchester, London, that kind of thing. Um, and then when that's over, we then look to the next <laughs> event and it kind of con- continues to cycle. So um, I'm hoping it stays quiet from another sport perspective because I kind of cover technically all Olympic and Paralympic sports. Okay. Things are unfortunately at the moment quite quiet. So uh, yeah, hopefully it will be mostly an ISL focus for the next five weeks or so. But we are heading towards winter, which means, you know, skiing, snowboarding and uh, bobsleigh and things like that are coming back as well. Gotcha. Uh, well, Nick, thank you so much for taking the time to come chat with us a bit, preview the ISL. Um, I would love to bring you back onto the podcast at some point in the next coming weeks so we can talk about how the coverage is going um, your perspective on the racing and you know what that finale that's now scheduled to happen in Budapest might look like. Coleman, it would be an honor. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.